but I got knocked down. But I know that you're here right now, and you say, Sometimes you lose, sometimes you win. Check, check one, check two. Sounds good. A little bit more. Check one, check two. Test, test one, two. Test, test. Ken, did I give you announcement channels? On I think we're good. You good, Ken?
So close that I can feel you, but I've lost the words to express. And though my eyes have never seen you, I've seen enough to say. I know that you are good. I know that you are kind. I know that you are so. Still close when I can't feel you. I don't have to be afraid. And though my eyes have never seen you, I've seen enough to say. I know that you are. I know.
Good morning. It's a blessing to worship with you this morning. And hello to those of you watching online. Over the past several weeks, we have gradually worked towards regathering as a church. We instituted two services, brought back Children's Church, and on September 6th, we will reopen our nursery area. In addition, on September 16th, we will jumpstart our midweek children's ministry. On October 4th, we plan to regather for Sunday school and adult classes. In order to do this and maintain social distancing, the Sunday school hour will be held between the two worship services. Our first worship service will begin at 9 a.m. We will follow that with 45 minutes of Sunday school for children, youth, and adults. Those classes will end at 1045 in preparation for a second service to begin promptly at 11 a.m. We feel that it is important to get our children back to Sunday school and re-engage our adults in fellowship. We will make every effort to make this as safe as possible. We will continue to encourage the wearing of masks. Forge and Refine return in October. These are six-week discipleship challenges designed to help us refocus on our relationships with Jesus, each other, and our own bodies. Participants join with accountability groups formed to encourage and hold one another accountable to our goals. Registration will open in a few weeks, so we encourage you to start now in forming your groups with other men and women inside or outside of our church family. Students sixth grade and up are encouraged to join the challenge with a parent or a family member. Students ninth grade and up also have the option to join with other students or with a parent approved youth leader. Ideally, we would love for men to work with men and women to work with women. But if you're interested in joining, but hesitant to find a group, we welcome husband wife teams as well. Go to the discipleship page at mgbconline.com for more info. Remember that next week is our all church picnic at the park. Worship will begin at 10.30 a.m. Bring your lawn chair and your picnic lunch. Drink will be provided. Thank you for worshiping with us. For more information about these and other events, go to mgbconline.com. Good morning. We want to welcome everyone here, whether you're uh, watching uh, online or here in our worship center uh, for our Sunday morning service. So, Brian, guess what? Well, before you go any further, I was just going to oh, congratulate you, you on your big victory this week. Thank you. Woo! Clap for me. Big victory. Well, well, actually, we, we had a game of horse, you, myself. It was, it was a game of pig. Okay, we, we played pig. It was you and me, and then we had Dylan Deedle there, right? Yeah, he was. So he I was just want to congratulate you because you beat Dylan on an eight-foot rim. And well, I wasn't gonna brag, but you know, I, I did beat an eight-year-old. He is eight years old, right? Eight-foot rim. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was, that so was I just great. want to congratulate you on that on that victory. I know you really celebrated running around the parking lot it after. Big moment. I was in my office working apparently during all of this. I don't. Yes, you were. Okay. Yes, you were. Just want to point that out. Yeah. Okay. So, I'm, I'm bonding with the kids. It's my job. Back off. <laughs> Anyways, so we know this is a really special week for everyone because Tuesday, a lot of the kids go back to school and every parent felt like they were like leaving Egypt and going to the promised land. So that's great. Unless you go to Northern Summer still. <laughs> There's a couple of women's announcements here uh, just to highlight. For more information on these announcements, Make sure you go to the website. Divorce Care for Women will begin September the 10th. And then a Bible study, Experiencing God, led by uh, Sandy Rice, will be starting September the 15th. And our Ladies Fall Retreat would be the weekend of uh, September the 25th. All of those, again, to sign up or more information, go to the website. Also, as you know, we've been currently living under very difficult times and a lot of upheaval in our country. But Scripture tells us, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. So with this in mind, I want to highlight two events. One, next Wednesday night, 7 o'clock uh, in the, uh, excuse me, next Sunday night at 6 o'clock in the multi-purpose room following the uh, picnic in the afternoon. At 6 o'clock, we'll be gathering together in the multi-purpose room to pray over the needs of our nation. So it's an opportunity to collectively come together. Also, starting this Wednesday, along with youth activities. That's right. And there's youth activities this Wednesday. The Children's Church area upstairs, a large room, will be available for collective prayer. It's open to anyone who would like to come and join with other people to pray for various needs within our church, our community, the nation. So that's this coming Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. And you're welcome to join us. All right. So 
I want to uh, congratulate you on your victory as well. Okay. For bragging about being a 34 year old man in pig. And yeah. Over my head. As much as I encourage you to take the rim up to 10 feet so that we could okay, shoot. We're going to move on now. Okay. We're going to go to our call to worship. Please stand. Our call to worship comes from Psalm 136, verses 1 through 3. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his steadfast love endures forever. Join me in prayer. Uh, thank you, Father, for this wonderful time that we can come together and worship you. And I just pray that we will recognize you as the Lord of Lords, that you are our God and that you have saved us. Uh, please help us engage with you in worship. We give this prayer in your son's name. Amen. Glad to have you all with us here to worship this morning. So uh, let's sing along as we sing the song, Never Gonna Let Me Go. song we're going to sing uh, is a new one. We haven't done it on a Sunday morning here before. 
It's called I Choose to Worship. It's by a band called the Wren Collective. And uh, raise your hand if you've heard of the Wren Collective. Let's make this audience. Yeah, all right, that's cool. If you haven't listened to them yet, you should. Uh, they put this album out, I think, like the second or third week of the whole uh, shutdown. Um, and that means that they must have been working on it before everything happened because you don't put an album out in three weeks. Uh, but it was so timely. And this was the name of the, the album, Choose to Worship. And uh, that just it hit me hard. Um, it continues to hit me hard thinking, like, sometimes... I'm the worship leader, and I come in, and I don't, I don't really feel like it. Uh, I'm distracted, or maybe maybe something happened this week, um, but it's still a choice. It's still a choice to worship in our hearts. It's still a choice uh, to sing these words and to mean them when we sing them, and it's still a choice as we go outside of these doors after Sunday morning ends to worship God through everything that we do. So it's a good reminder for me that circumstances don't dictate uh, my ability to worship or, or whether I should or shouldn't worship, uh, but it's a choice that we, that we consciously, actively have to make and remind ourselves, worshiping the creator of the universe, worshiping our savior. Um, so as we uh, learn this song, as you learn this song, we teach it to you, um, I just ask that you take some time to let these words sink in. Uh, so we'll start with the chorus. Let's pull the chorus up first, Garrett, and we'll teach you that, and we'll back up and teach you the rest of the song. I knew that was going to happen. I knew it was going to be out of tune. Good enough. All right. I will praise you through the fire, through the storm, and through the flood. There is nothing that can ever steal my soul. In the valley, you are worthy. You are good when life is not. You will always and forever be my song. Let's sing that again. I will pray. I will praise you through the fire, through the storm, and through the flood. There is nothing that can ever steal my soul. In the valley, you are worthy. You are good when life is not. You will always and forever be my soul. Let's go right to that first verse. I choose to worship. I choose to bow. Though there's pain in the offering, I lay it down. Here in the conflict, when doubt surround. Though my soul is unraveling, I choose you. Now let's sing that again. I choose to worship. I choose to bow. Though there's pain in the offering, I lay it down. Here in the conflict, when doubt surrounds. Though my soul is unraveling, I choose you. I'll praise you. And I will praise you through the fire, through the storm, and through the flood.
Father God, we choose you now. We choose to worship. The difficult times surround us, and we struggled over the last several months, Father, within our community and with all of the various aspects of change, but you remain constant. We come this morning and we bow down before you. We choose to worship you, Father. Lord, I just pray that you will continue to bless in our community. I just pray that as Brant comes this morning, as, as he preaches from your word, that you will open our hearts and our minds. Meet us where we are in our individual circumstances in our lives and shape us and change us. Lord, we choose to worship you. We give this prayer in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Children, you are dismissed. Miss Erin is over there. Miss Jerry is over here. So whichever side you go to, we want to dismiss you to Children's Church. God has blessed Martinsburg Grace Brethren Church to be able to travel to Barbuda and assist there with uh, hurricane relief. As you recall, the island was devastated by Hurricane Irma. Our teams have gone there. We've had multiple teams go and join Bonnie Floyd Ministry to help rebuild homes. We've provided educational support. We've sent uh, food down, our money down, to purchase food for the needy on the island, as you can understand with um, the lockdown and all of that, there's been a lot of stress put on the island because they rely on things coming over from Antigua in order to provide their basic necessities. Recently, Austin Berkheimer uh, partnered with Don and Bonnie Floyd to travel to the island, and they have sent back a video to give us a little update of their work there. And so if you would please run that video, that would be greatly appreciated, guys. Thanks. Well, hello, MGBC, from the beautiful island of Barbuda. The three of us have made it back safely, and I have to tell you, it is good to be back. We did have to quarantine for about 14 days. We did a lot of air hugs, and we um, we did a lot of blowing of kisses. And But what was wonderful is when word spread that we were back, people came over to see us, even though they knew that they couldn't come in. We have made really good use of our time mm -hmm. under quarantine. We got to Barbuda and had about five or six days left in our quarantine, so we were just restricted to basically inside of our fence. One of the biggest things we were able to accomplish is just finally getting the yard cleaned up, getting everything trimmed up, weed whacked, and just a lot of stuff that there was just some junk laying around that you always had to work around and it just wasn't important at the time. Right. Um, but we were able to get stuff cleaned up and it just looks beautiful. It's, it it's so welcoming. Um, and it was a, just a good reminder and opportunity while we're here to just, you know, um, be good stewards of what yes. God has blessed you with. And something else we were able to do is Donnie built custom cistern lids, um, which is very important. Um, water down here is, is extremely important, and you don't want to have any issues whatsoever. So we're now able to lock and secure our water supply, which is awesome. And our small cistern is now almost completely full, and then the big one is a about a third of the way full, mm -hmm. which is awesome because that's more water than we had for yeah. all the teams in February. Yeah. So that's super encouraging. We're, we're so thankful for that. It's yeah. really great. Also, we have a new project uh, added to our ministry here, and it's called the Garden and Gate Program, and it commenced today. So we're really excited. This week we're going to be doing some filming and taking some pictures to be able to explain this project to you more and how it works and how it's going to benefit greatly the people of Barbuda. We're looking forward to that. Um, we miss you guys. We love you. You are such a part of what we're doing yes. here. And uh, Donnie and I are excited because we're coming to Pennsylvania in September. In just a couple of weeks, we'll yeah. be there. So we'll get to see you so in we'll person. So we'll get to visit. But we're just trying to prepare everything so that you guys can come even yes. maybe later this year when we come back or definitely next year. Yes. But um, thank you for loving us. Thank you for praying and supporting us. Yeah. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. Bye, guys. See you soon. Well, let's have a word of prayer for that ministry. Dear God, thank you for the way you're working around this world and that little country of Barbuda. We pray that uh, you'll continue to bless uh, Bonnie Floyd and her ministry, Donnie, and also Austin as he's been there. It's such a wonderful thing to see a young man from our church uh, doing missions. And we just pray that you'll continue to bless and that the people will be reached. There are so many needs and so many hurts. We thank you for this opportunity to be in your word today. And uh, I know it will be a challenging sermon for all of us, but we pray that you'll 
Help us to really think about uh, these things. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, I want to start off by simply asking maybe a strange question for a sermon. Um, but before I do that, I just want to remind you that we do have the notes for the sermon on the Uversion app. So if you go to that, go to under events, you'll find our church listed there. But the strange question I want to ask you is this. What do you put on your cereal? What do you put on your cereal? Well, when we were kids, that was an easy answer because there was only one option. And because we grew up on a dairy farm, we got to drink raw milk. We would take our pitcher and get it out of the tank. So it was unpasteurized milk and the cream separates. And, and so you have to shake your milk or it, you know, it, it looks kind of strange. If you don't shake it, you, need, you get, get that cream mixed up. And I think there were people that thought you would die if you drank unpasteurized milk, but we didn't. We're still alive. We drank it every day. It was awesome. But then changes happened with milk. They used to pay you more for the butter fat in your milk, but not anymore. Nobody wants fat. So then they went to 2% reduced fat, and I couldn't handle that. We wanted the real stuff, the red jug, not the blue cap on the top. And then they went to the pink, the white water is what it is, you know, skim. And if you drink skim, I hope you're not offended. You have that right to drink skim, but it's not for me. And then, now in the 21st century, we have all kinds of milk, and I put that in quotes, and I want to make sure I don't get in trouble with the dairy farmers, because they'll point out this is not milk. But listen to all these options, and I know I don't even have all of them listed. There's almond milk, coconut milk, soy milk, rice milk, oat milk, cashew milk, hemp milk. I want to know hemp milk? That's a little, that could be a little questionable. Uh, macadamia milk and lactose intolerant milk, and there's all kinds of milk. So what do you put on your cereal? It comes back to preference. It, it's whatever you prefer to put on your cereal. And so we have all these options. Apparently Americans like our preferences and our choices. I find it interesting though that today raw milk is on a comeback. In fact, I think people think it's new, but it's always been around. <laughs> I mean, people really want to buy just raw milk now, and whole milk is, has made a big resurgence as we've gotten away from the skim milks. So what preference do you have? It's really up to you to make that choice. But personally, my favorite milk, which I don't drink very often because it's not always the best for me, is Richie's chocolate milk. And it has to be Richie's. The other brands aren't the same. I don't know what they do. I don't know what Andrew does, but something is unique with Richie's chocolate milk, in my opinion. But that's my preference. Maybe you don't like chocolate milk. Maybe you prefer another brand. But we each have our preferences. You know, we also have preferences in the spiritual realm as well. But before I go any further, I need to make sure I make this clear right up front. There are scriptural principles that we all must have unity on and that we all must all agree on. Scriptural principles are what we call black and white. Preferences are gray. But let me say this right up front. Principles are non-negotiable scriptural truths such as the Trinity, the cross, the resurrection, salvation by grace through faith, that lying, still stealing, adultery, lust are sin. But there are other areas that aren't as clear cut in scripture. And in those cases, we're going to use the word preferences today or issues of conscience, the scripture says. Christians are given freedom to come up with their own convictions as the Holy Spirit guides them in those areas. What are some of those preferences? Well, these get a little touchy, but it's entertainment choices such as what music you listen to, movies, can you go to movies, what movies can you watch, dancing, or how we dress. Modesty is a black and white, but how that's defined gets a little touchier. Another big question is, is it possible for a Christian to drink alcohol? And if so, how much? Or not at all? In my opinion, that's a preference issue because I don't see a scripture that says that drinking alcohol is a sin. The Bible says drinking too much alcohol is a sin. Drunkenness is a sin. 
So we must be careful not to make everything absolute. There are preferences. So that might make us, some of us very uncomfortable. But it's important that we don't make the Bible say something that it doesn't say. That's where legalism creeps in. And it puts a yoke on people, which isn't necessary. It wasn't placed there by God. Legalism can breed pride and arrogance. And we've seen people who were very arrogant about their preferences and felt everyone else had to totally agree with them on every issue of life. And that is not a good place to be. That's what Romans 14 addresses. So let's usher in a really fun topic today in Romans 14, another difficult passage of Scripture to deal with. We don't shy away from the difficult things here at Grace Brethren Church. Over the last few weeks, we've discovered that to be happy in community, we need to love one another, and we also need to respect our governing authorities. Today, our challenge is to show grace to a brother or sister who has a different preference on a matter of conscience. In Romans 14, we see two examples presented. Now, these examples aren't really big deals today. So we have to take the principles from these two and apply it to our issues of preference today. But in Romans 14, it addresses the consumption of meat, and it deals with religious celebrations. So turn in your Bibles to Romans 14. We're going to look at Romans 14 right at the beginning of the chapter here. It says this, As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or fall. Here we see some believers in the church ate meat. Others only ate vegetables. Personally, I absolutely love vegetables. I just love vegetables. I love all vegetables. So I'm a vegetarian. But I also very, very, very much love a juicy, medium-rare steak. So I guess I'm not just a vegetarian. I'm a meat eater, too. That's my preference. Some of you may be vegetarian. Some of you are vegan. Some of you choose to eat other things. That's your preference. I may not agree with you. I may think, why wouldn't you want to eat a big steak? Because they're so good. But that's your preference. And I need to respect you have a different preference. And you have to respect my preference as well. And not impose vegetarian beliefs on me. Because that's an area of preference in life. Also here we see the issue of holidays. Jewish Christians still wanted to celebrate their past holidays once they came to Christ. Where Gentiles didn't really care about those holidays. So Romans 14 verse 5 continues this. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God. While the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. We simply respect Christians can disagree on preferences, and we give those differences to the Lord. That's how we resolve it, in love. Remember, our, our whole series is about faith and community and loving one another. We should be concerned basically for our own beliefs when it comes to preferences and allow God to deal with other people who have other preferences. It's interesting, Romans 14 uses the term strong and weak, and we need to define those and understand what's happening here. This isn't saying that one is weak morally and the other one is strong morally. That's not what it's talking about here. It says that, it actually says it emphatically here, that the stronger brother is to look out for the weaker brother. And this is what it's talking about. The strong Christian is mature and he understands the freedoms that he has because of the cross. The cross gives us a lot of freedom. Liberty is another word you'll hear. He has freedoms concerning his preferences. But the stronger one is to look out for the weaker brother. Who's the weaker brother? The weaker brother is probably someone who's newer in his faith, not always, 
but he is simply immature in his understanding on freedom and liberty. We Christians here were most likely Jewish converts who came from a strict adherence to the law. They had developed a legalistic mindset. They were shackled by the law. So legalistic people are the weak that it's referring to here. But Christ fulfilled the law. He's the one that fulfilled all those laws. These weak Christians felt the need to follow the dietary regulations and celebrate the Jewish holidays. And that is their right to do so. Even as a Christian, they could still have the, follow the Jewish holidays. In addition, the weak Gentile Christians had problems with eating meat that had been sacrificed to idols. And that's a whole other discussion that comes into this. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 through, through chapter 10. And I just don't have time to unpack all of that today. But if you want to read that passage, it would relate quite well. These specific issues were a big deal. The eating of meat and the meat sacrificed to idols issue, and as well as the holidays. They were a big deal during biblical times. Not so much in America. We don't really debate those things today. But we see here that disunity developed in the church because they weren't respecting one another's preferences. So this has been pretty maybe heavy or technical. So let's get real. Let's get real practical. And this puts me on probably some shaky ground with some people. But let's, let's go there. Because I believe this is what the scripture's challenging us about this morning. Since I brought up the issue already earlier, let me go to the, the hardest issue on the list, in my opinion. I think it's the issue of drinking alcohol. The Bible clearly teaches without a shadow of a doubt, without a shadow of a doubt, drinking alcohol to excess to drunkenness is sin. When something is controlling your mind, and it's not the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 4 says, it is sin. But it is another thing to say that all drinking, all drinking of alcohol is sin, when the Bible doesn't teach that. Some people may be dogmatic on that issue and feel strongly about that, and that's their personal right. They're, again, a preference. But other Christians, good Christians, may have a different opinion on that issue. Jesus didn't condemn drinking at the wedding at Cana. He actually encouraged it by turning water into wine. And it was wine. Go to Israel, they'll tell you that it was wine. The, they're... There are people that say it wasn't wine, and that's just false. That's not being accurate. So we need to be accurate to the culture and to the text. So this issue is a preference issue, not a principle. And that makes us maybe a little uncomfortable. But Romans 14.3, as we read earlier, says this. It provides the response. Let not the one who eats, and I'm going to also use the word drinks here, let the one who eats or drinks despise not, let not the one who eats or drinks despise the one who abstains. And, not, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats or drinks, for God has welcomed him. The point is we're to love one another when we disagree on preferences. And I think we can discuss it and we can debate it. We should do that. But we need to ultimately love one another. It is not our job to get everyone to agree on every preference that will never happen, but we are to love one another. A fancy way to sum this up is this. I'm not sure who said this quote, but I like this. In biblical essentials, the principles, the non-negotiables, we have unity. We need to have total unity on those things. On non-essentials or preferences, we have freedom, liberty. In all things, we need to have love. One thing we should ask ourselves concerning our preferences is this. Is what I'm practicing going to help me move toward Christ and holiness, or does it cause me to move away? So anytime we feel strongly about a preference, we better be asking, is this going to help me grow closer to Christ? 1 Corinthians 10.31 says this. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. That is an important biblical principle. Randy Smith says this about preferences. He's a Grace Brethren pastor in Sebring, Florida. 
When we make it our business to check out the liberty of others beyond the obedience to the text of Scripture, we set ourselves up to become haughty and judgmental. We need to have conviction about what we believe on a certain issue while extending grace to others who feel differently. I think that's really good advice. It is vital that for the sake of conscience of the weaker Christian, it is important that we choose to refrain from any activity that would cause damage to their spiritual life or cause them to fall into sin. So if someone has a preference and they're, they're choosing to do that, but they're not considering their brother, and they're causing one not just to be offended, but if they're causing them to fall back into a sin that they have struggled with, they're not caring for them and they're not showing love, and they need to refrain from that activity. Doing something that hinders someone's spiritual life even if it's technically permissible, should not be practiced because we aren't showing love. Romans 14, 4 says this, Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. Ultimately, everyone gives an account to the Lord on preference issues. And that I take great comfort in. I don't have to judge everybody's preferences. I can let God deal with that. So let me make this relatable again. If you're a Christian who feels all drinking is wrong, that is totally your right, and you don't have to drink. Others must respect you for your conviction. But if another Christian comes to a different conclusion and feels drinking alcohol in moderation, not drunkenness, it is permissible that the one who does not drink cannot be judgmental of the one who does. Give that issue over to the Lord. Keep in mind, for the one who has liberty to do something, that doesn't mean you're totally free to do it. If you're leading others to sin, you should voluntarily give up that freedom so the conscience of the weaker brother or sister is not violated. And I keep saying it, it all comes back to love and how we respect one another. Romans 14.6 sums it up this way. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord. See, we're supposed to do everything in honoring the Lord. Since he gives thanks to God, while the other who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. We should avoid anything that would make a weak Christian think less of his faith. And we should avoid anything that would cause an unsaved person to feel more comfortable with his or her sin. That's a really important issue as well, our testimony. Romans 14, 10 through 12 continues the challenge by saying this. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. We will all give an account for those preferences that we choose. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. We must rest in the Holy Spirit's work. Sometimes we try to be the Holy Spirit. I think people that fall into legalism try to be the Holy Spirit. They try to be God in, in the lives of other people. And they need to let the Holy Spirit do that work. He will bring about growth. Growth comes at different speeds and levels. We may grow at a certain speed, but another Christian may be slow at growth. Or there's a longer process in how God's working. But God is working, and we need to trust him. I want to leave you with a process of how you evaluate preferences in your life and this issue that was presented in Romans 14. I have to admit, this was not an easy sermon to try to encapsulate. We could have more discussion. I have a feeling probably someone wants to send me some emails and discuss it, and I'm fine with that. But let me summarize it this way on preferences. I think this is a good grid to follow when it comes to preferences in our lives. Number one is what I'm doing sinful. Don't try to make an excuse and say, well, that's my preference. But if it's a black and white in Scripture, it's really clear that's not a preference, that's a principle. So if it's sin, stop it. Stop doing it. Don't try to make it out to be a preference when it isn't. Number two, does what you desire to do going against your conscience? That's not the Holy Spirit. 
The conscience is, sep is separate. Every man has, every woman has a conscience that tells them when it, what they're doing is right or wrong. And if your conscience is telling you that it's not right, then we shouldn't do it. Number three, is it unwise to do what you're doing? It's just unwise. It's not smart. Ephesians 5.15 says that. Is it beneficial to do the activity? 1 Corinthians 10 verses 23 and 24 says, All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Did you hear that? What we do should be for the good of our neighbor. Number five, will it glorify God? 1 Corinthians 10, 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. We talked about that in the message. Number six, will it cause consequences in your life? Will you become bound to it? So addictive things. If it becomes addictive, will you be bound to it? Is it harmful to your body? Then you should not do it. You know, smoking is one of those areas of preference. The Bible never speaks on smoking. But we know that smoking is harmful to your body. It causes cancer. So that individual has to evaluate whether they should do it or not. It says this in 1 Corinthians 6, 12. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything or bound to it. Number seven, will it cause another person to fall into sin? And if so, don't do it. It's not good to do something if it causes someone to sin. 1 Corinthians 8 talks about that. And then number eight, will it affect my Christian testimony for those who don't know Christ? Is it worth doing the activity if it causes a non-believer to turn away from Christ? Romans 14 verses 13 through 15 says this. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in and of itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. As the band comes forward, I uh, want to just present a blunt challenge. I'm usually known as the nice guy who's not very confrontive. Now, my family might disagree with that. But when I read this, I was like, ooh, I kind of bristled a little bit. Dr. Randy Smith said this. And you know what? He's absolutely right. And so I need to give you this challenge concerning Romans 14. He can say it much better than I can. He says this, stop trying to fix other people. That's what legalism does. Stop trying to fix other people and start cleaning up things that can cause them to trip over your life. We worry way too much about other people's sins and not enough about our own. I added that. To those who are tempted to judge everyone, stop making trouble. Grow up and be truly mature. You don't know everything, and your judgmental spirit isn't helping to equip people. Maybe you believe something strongly, and that is your right, but the other person doesn't. God will grow him in time. He will grow you as well. We all need love. We all need grace. None of us are perfect. We all struggle in this spiritual life. There are tough words to hear, but we needed to hear them because we have a tendency to become a little legalistic in this community. But Romans 14, 19 says this, so then let us pursue what makes for peace and mutual upbringing. Let us make for peace and mutual upbringing or encouragement, and that is our goal. Let us love one another in regard to preferences. Let's pray. Dear Lord, this is not an easy thing. We all have our opinions. Boy, have we seen opinions in our society. I find it interesting how many people say, 
that we need to be so tolerant, and yet nobody's tolerant. No one's tolerant of Christians. No one's tolerant of anyone else. Christians aren't tolerant of other Christians. We need to share our beliefs, our convictions on principles. We should not waver. And it's good to talk about and be challenged about our preferences. But ultimately, we must let you be God. And we need to love one another by allowing the Holy Spirit to work in the lives of others whom we disagree with. We must do this. So help us to see where we have been weak in that area and to make the change and to show grace and love to those around us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please stand.
Lord, help us to show love and grace to those whom we disagree. Help us to talk about it and to respect one another. And we need to be challenged. We're not always right. And we need your Holy Spirit to guide us. If we are doing anything that is offensive to someone else to the point where it's causing them to sin or it's hurting and hindering their faith, then we need to stop doing that out of love. So help us to evaluate. Do we have a judgmental spirit? Do we need to say we're sorry to someone because we've judged them and we haven't been gracious and loving? Or is there something that we need to change to show love to another, to the weaker brother? Challenge us with these things. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Have a good day, everyone.